in here on my computer. I'm just going to turn everything off. So that's that fine. It a doesn't... few beeps are, are not a problem. I suppose. Okay, right. I think we might be live. Yep. Uh, the, the, the buttons all say we're live. Andrew is turning off his beeps and buzzes and other exciting things. Welcome to the Squirrel Squadron. Uh, glad to see people here. And uh, as people join, I will do a little bit of an introduction for anyone who may just be happening upon us and saying, who the heck are these folks? And uh, also for people who watch on the recording, because uh, some folks may not be able to stay the whole time and other people have said they're really interested. But because this is at a funny time, which I'll explain in a moment, not our usual late afternoon, uh, we're, uh, we may have more people on the recording, which is great. So uh, you've happened upon, if you've happened upon us, the Squirrel Squadron, uh, which is my community of tech and non-tech people getting together and talking about interesting topics. And that's exactly what's going to happen to here. I'm a former CTO. I know a lot about technology. I write code when people let me. Um, Andrew is not at all technical in that way. But man, is he smart. He knows everything about nonprofits and strategy. And he's all coming to us all the way from Australia. Uh, so um, uh, he either has wine or water. I'm not sure which, but he's uh, up late and uh, willing to chat to us uh, about, about technology and how that applies in his work with uh, loads of different interesting companies. So I'll let him introduce himself in just a moment. Let me just mention a few things about the Squirrel Squadron in case people are curious, if you don't know what this is about, uh, that the Squadron has events like this every week. Uh, next week, we have one uh, on a different day and a different time uh, with someone from California named Lisa Anderson, who's going to talk to us about tech and supply chain and what dark stores mean and whether the Ever Given is going to crash again and, and stop all our, uh, all our toys coming from China. So. Uh, we're going to talk about technology's role there. Uh, that's coming next week. The week after that, I have a free Zoom call. These are all free, by the way. This is always uh, my way of giving back to the community. Um, uh, the uh, uh, one the week after that is all about key people. So uh, you got a key person in your technology team or in your sales team or anywhere else. What do you do when you couldn't imagine that person being hit by a bus? What's the bus factor for your team and, and how do you de-risk that? So that's going to be our topic in a couple of weeks. And we do these every week. Um, they're um, a whole history. We've got more than a year and a half now of uh, um, events. Have a look at squirrelsquadron.com if you're interested. And of course, there's also the forum uh, where we had a very nice poll of why people were motivated. If it wasn't profit, what was motivating them? Um, as preparation for this, we've also had uh, discussions about... Um, uh, uh, what else have we had recently? I actually have to look. Uh, I haven't looked in a while um, uh, at all the different topics. We have one about um, what, what's happening in the Oscars and uh, how people handle crises. So that's a very interesting one. I haven't read that one yet. Um, but uh, we've also been looking at um, how to plan your technology team's work. What's a better way to plan than creating a roadmap, possibly? Um, what, how people are afraid, what fear means in um, tech teams and not tech teams. Interesting topics, 1,700 people on the forum, uh, all kinds of uh, experts and, and interesting things happening there. So I'd love to see people um, joining up to that. That's at squirrelsquadron.com. So uh, uh, yeah, by the way, for people who are here live, uh, we'd love to see your comments and questions and thoughts. So uh, give us a shout in whatever for format you're on. I, it says we're on Facebook, uh, LinkedIn, and YouTube. I think it's all working. So uh, give us a shout. Say why you're here. That would be most interesting. And uh, we're looking for questions as we go as well. But let me start by uh, asking Andrew to introduce himself. I've known Andrew for many years. Um, uh, we worked together in many uh, different workshops and events uh, through a guy named Alan Weiss that we both know. And uh, Andrew uh, and I were chatting, it must have been six months ago now, about uh, nonprofits and how they relate to technology. And I said, you got to come on the live stream. We finally made it happen. Uh, Andrew, tell us all about you. Uh, what do you do there in Australia and around the world? And um, uh, what makes you interested in technology? Well, it's interesting. You said you said that um, uh, I don't uh, bring that much technology to my work. I, oh, you do, you I, do. But you're not a coder. You're not no, someone not who, who makes Absolutely the technology. Not. You use no. it like a, a demon. Well, this is the fascinating thing. My clients, and I'll explain to people on the live stream who my clients are in a moment, but my clients are often absolutely 
gobsmacked and deeply impressed by the fact that I know how to use uh, digital canvas tools like Miro, or I can make a Loom video as an explainer of a strategic concept, and they're blown away by these things. These are people who frequently struggle to use things like Slack and those sorts of uh, uh, tools, uh, because most of the people I'm working with are um, uh, upper, middle, or very senior decision makers and executives in organisations. So this puts them automatically above 40 years of age, um, which is automatically, generationally speaking, they are not digital natives on the whole. Mm-hmm. Now, I work as a strategic advisor to organisations that uh, run the systems that run society. Now, you might ask, what does that mean? And what that means is any time you need something, whether it's water out of a tap, whether it's a well-built road to drive on, whether it's an operation in a hospital, uh, whether it's uh, uh, food that is uh, healthy and safe to eat in a supermarket, there is some public institution that is responsible for the regulation of public health and safety, the treatment of cancer, the uh, building of road infrastructure, and they're my clients. So I work with very large entities like the United Nations is a client of mine. I work with governments, with regulatory authorities, and of course, as Squirrel indicated, I work with a huge array of non-profit or for-purpose organisations. And what binds them all together is that literally none of them are motivated by profit, as in monetary profit. What they're motivated by is societal impact. And my job is, as a strategist, is to help them formulate uh, a vision of the future that they cannot conceive of themselves. And it's then to help them craft roadmaps or pathways to help them get there as expediently as possible. And of course, it's to assist them in being the sorts of leaders they need to be and assemble and marshal the necessary skill sets, capabilities and approaches that they need. Amongst them, of course, is the digital, and that's what we're really here to talk about today. Absolutely. And how does that come in? So if you're talking to one of these, and I'd say, I'd certainly say that um, governments should at least be purpose led, that their, their motive yeah. is to, I hope, make better roads and better health care and things. Sometimes I worry they're not actually motivated by that. But that's a different question. But uh, assuming that they're purpose led in that way, where does yeah. tech come in for them? Do they think of it as um, like a utility? It's just like turning on the lights and they, they don't consider it. Is it something that's a mis- mystery to them? They, they'd like to use it better that they don't know how? Where does it fit? It's a great question, Squirrel. And my observation is that mostly they do not have a coherent concept of what technology is or how it can be used. So let me give you uh, an example. Uh, I'm working presently with a very large national um, uh, cultural institution. Uh, It's an art museum. Um, So in the UK, think about the Tate or uh, the National Gallery. We're talking that that level. Um, And you think about an organisation like that and what would they be using technology for? How do they think about this? Well, they're thinking about it in so many different ways that they can't think about it in one way. So they're thinking about it as, well, we need data about the sorts of people who are visiting and why they visit and how often they visit and what they buy from us. So we, that's, that's a technology application. We also use technology for the actual exhibiting of art. In other words, we have art that is digital. So uh, we need to understand the new horizons in that realm. Um, We also uh, need to use technology in order to streamline the standard business systems that every organisation has, be they for-profit or not-for-profit, the usual stuff, you know, your, um, you know, ERP-type applications. So, uh, you know, that's just a start. Now, what tends to happen, of course, is you have different people responsible for each of those pieces. You've got curators (laughs) running the exhibitions. You've got uh, operations people running the ERP systems. uh, And you've got marketing and comms and engagement people interacting with the public. 
and each of them will have different types of maturity, different outlooks on what technology is usable within that context. And that would apply whether you're a, an art museum, a hospital, um, a roads authority, uh, a pollution and waste regulatory authority. It doesn't matter. Got it. Got it. Makes sense. And um, what I didn't hear anywhere in any of that is something that a lot of um, people that I work with most often who are for profit are thinking about all the time, which is how to use technology to innovate, how to offer a new product. So yeah. although you did say the art museum might have a, a digital exhibition, they probably didn't think that up themselves. My, my wife actually is an art historian. She you know, Go yeah. to lisasquirrel.com if you're interested in what she does, because she's amazing. She's blind and she leads tours for other blind people in art galleries. Just uh, astonishing what she can do. And she was leading one at the Barbican here in the UK, which is a big, has a big art gallery. And um, the artist had created an interactive um, video so that you could stand in front of it and it would kind of put you in the scene and it would move around in response to what you were doing. So the kids loved it, as you can imagine, they'd just stand there and make all kinds of silly gestures. Uh, but I don't think the Barbican thought that up. The artist came to them and said, great, as part of my exhibition with you, I'm going to show this thing. And they said, oh, man, what do we do with this? But it yeah. doesn't sound like these folks, like, say, at the Road Authority are thinking, boy, how could we track potholes better? Maybe we can look at using artificial intelligence to look at pictures of the road and identify where there are potholes so we can go fix them. Is that right? Are they thinking that way or would they like to? I would. I think. I think that some of the innovators amongst them are thinking that way. But the decision makers I am frequently working with, they they are not. They are not. Um, and and to be fair to my art museum client, uh, I did omit a very important part of the uh, digital realm, which is of course using uh, digital means to heighten accessibility. In other words, just because you can't visit in person does not mean you cannot visit that gallery. And in fact, anyone on this call could visit that gallery today and see and interact with work. Uh, so yeah, that's a that's a valid point. Fantastic. So someone was innovating there. Someone said we need to be more accessible. COVID probably influenced it. We need if people can't get here, if they're bed bound or can't get out of the house or travel is difficult, yes. we need to make it more accessible to them. So that person thought of yeah. it, but but the people yeah. at the top that you work with tend not to say, oh, well, what we need is technology here. What we need is to go write some software or hire yeah. an expert in hardware or something like yeah. that. Yeah, yeah. And, and it's interesting because, because this particular uh, strategy that we're developing, there are a number of focus areas. And interestingly, one of them is digital. Um, uh, now, why did that even rise to the top out of the dozens, if not hundreds of issues that they could focus on? It actually came from the staff. It did mm. not come from the board of trustees nor from the executive team. Although, of course, the minute it was raised, it resulted in very vigorous uh, debate and discussion. It was not shut down. I, I don't want to give that impression. Uh, but, uh, yeah, these things have to uh, and do come from ground up. Well, that makes lots of sense. And I want to go to something there um, called Bring Your Own Device, which I want to talk about. Um, but I just want to say hi to Roland and David, uh, who both uh, put um, uh, bits in the in the chat here. Um, Roland's interested about in talking about motivation. Absolutely, we're coming to that very shortly. And uh, David is glad to see us. So excellent. Um, I know we have more folks around, so say hi. Also, stop us with questions. So um, Andrew and I both really like being in the moment answering topics um we do much we didn't do a ton of prep for this we haven't got a speech ready so we're going to do a lot better and those of you who know me know that's the case if you fire questions at us and ar argue with us so please do that in the chat if you'd like to uh, but andrew um i'm wondering uh if, speaking of grassroots mm -hmm. how these folks handled a revolution that happened a few years ago and, and then that's going to lead us to think about a future revolution i think one that's happening right now and, and that is uh, these little things. So at some point, um, mm -hmm. they didn't have anybody in their business, who their, their company, their organization, who had one of these mm -hmm. uh, telephones. And um, then everybody did. And mm -hmm. uh, that must have been a huge shift for them that they didn't anticipate, or, or maybe they did, but they, they certainly couldn't have anticipated it years before, that suddenly people would be turning up and taking pictures of the exhibitions and with a camera that was ubiquitous that everyone had in their pocket, that people would be tweeting about them, that their staff would be starting to use the phones and maybe sharing information that they shouldn't. 
how did these folks um, uh, interact with that bring your own device revolution? I, I see a huge amount of variation. I, I think there are some of my clients who still cannot and have not come to grips with this. So I would mm. put most of the health sector in this category. Uh, in, a, in, in this world, and I'm hunting around for my, my own phone, but in the real world, oughtn't I be able to go to my medical practice or to the hospital and I've got what I need here and as I'm interacting with my physician, uh, we're using my device, not their device. Exactly. That's the key <laughs> or, thing. For yeah. our interactions. And yes. that then means when I go home and I need something, I can interface here either through a human to human uh, conduit or simply informationally. Exactly. Now, yep. there are some aspects of the health system that here in Australia are doing this, and COVID was an absolute gift. Um, you know, I, I, I think that there were gifts of COVID. Absolutely. What well, forced us to all think about this. You know, we might not be on this live stream like this, talking all sure. the way to Australia, yeah. if it hadn't been that we'd been forced to set up the infrastructure for it. Yeah. But the, yeah. the healthcare system responded and, and did um, um, e-visits and, and uh, e-consults and things like that. Was that something you observed? Absolutely, absolutely. So uh, people were, uh, as an example, my mother is 90 years old. She's got a variety of physical issues, as most 90-year-olds do, and she is a uh, technological Luddite. She cannot use any device that involves the use of menu-driven systems. Her brain simply cannot deal with that. So pretty much anything after the year, what, 1985 is a mystery mm -hmm. to her. And uh, what that meant, though, was that when uh, her doctor wanted to video conference with her, they sent someone in the form of a nurse who actually used her device. Held up my the, oh, got it. Oh, fantastic. I did not realize that. But from an efficiency point of view, if you think about it, you're not sending the $200 an hour doctor, you're sending the $100 an hour nurse. And exactly. uh, as a consequence, uh, there are efficiencies built into this. And in fact, uh, there's very little of the doctor's time was actually needed. So, so th and, there and, are many... Someone must have been sort of forced to innovate there. This is a really interesting idea. They, they sort of had to do something new. Yes. Um, and it wasn't because they could make more profit. It was because their, their motivation to roll on this question in our topic today, uh, yeah. their, their motivation was how do we give care to these people? It might yeah. be uh, it's nice to reduce the cost, but I'm sure it was also physically impossible to send the doctor around to see everyone. The, you yeah. don't have enough doctors. So and you don't have enough doctors. And also in, in, uh, during COVID, where I live in Melbourne, uh, we, I believe, have the honour of being the most heavily locked down city in I the remember. world. remember, yeah. <laughs> We had, I don't know how many hundreds of days. And so uh, people were prohibited from mm -hmm. visiting. Uh, it, it, was, it was quite extraordinary. Um, but another example I'll give you, a Squirrel, is I've got a lot of clients who are in city government. I think what in the UK you call councils. Uh, we mm -hmm. call them councils as well. Uh, and they do everything, uh, the mundane, the emptying of bins and rubbish, uh, trash collection, uh, but they also do road repair. Uh, they do parkland maintenance, sporting facilities, all that sort of thing. They run libraries, et cetera, et cetera. Now, now, uh, in the old days, if I as a resident had an issue with something, there was a pothole, a tree had fallen down, somebody had put obscene graffiti on a wall near my house, I would have to phone the council and the council would do what? They would send a person out to assess the situation. Yep. But guess what? guess what they do now? Take a picture. Exactly. And so, mm -hmm. you know, this, it, it's not new technology, but your question was, how did the um, innovation occur? And how the innovation occurred was by numerous councils sitting around saying, we cannot, in a cost effective way, address the volume of inbound inquiries in a way that fulfills our fundamental mission which is to provide a livable environment for 100,000 people, let's say. Mm -hmm. And so uh, they were forced to uh, look, at, look at ways around this. Fascinating. And it seems like there's a, there's a role for creative people, for innovators who yeah. come up with these sorts of things, who are, who are forced and someone's saying, oh, my God, what can we do? And they're thinking they have to raise taxes, they have to spend more, they have to have more people go around to see more 
more graffiti. But yeah. then somebody says, hey, wait a minute. I got a phone in my pocket. I could do something more. Yeah. Is yeah. that right? There's, yeah, there's that, a wonderful that, that, example of that, that, um, that uh, uh, a very, very bright product-oriented person, someone who designs software products, told me about. He was working at Network Rail, the, the main rail authority in Britain. And he was on a train and he was bored. And he had one of these phones. And uh, it was new and it was exciting. And he said, you know... My job, he was in charge of the signalman, the people who pull the levers and actually make sure the train goes the right way or stops when it should go somewhere. And he said, there's a lot we could do to communicate with those signalmen through phones. I mean, they all have phones. I have a phone. We could tell them things. And, and right now I pick up physical phones and call them and, and go to see them as I am now in the train. So he said, well, I got a two-hour train, train journey. I wonder if I could learn to write an app. And darned if he didn't download something that allowed him to create an app. He made an app. And by the time he got to the end, he said, hey, Signalman, why don't you try this? They all installed it and, and mm -hmm. sort of took over. And he, he then became, from being in charge of Signalman, nothing to do with technology, he became the head of uh, Network Rails uh, digital uh, app uh, development. <laughs> so, yeah. Having yeah. taught himself how to do it. He has wonderful stories of, of the, the <laughs> days of Network Rail. But um, uh, the, the point is that you've got these kinds of people at the grassroots. And I think that's one of our, our main learnings here, certainly a learning for me. Yeah. Those are the people who know where the um, technology can be used. Yeah. And they're going to bring it up from, from the middle tier, from the bottom tier, from the people on the front line, the signalman. Yeah. And that's what's going to influence the boardroom. That's really interesting. Yes, yes. Uh, and and I, I see that there is... Uh, a frontier in terms of technology, which creates a transparency of information throughout an organisation. Because in the old days, information was so heavily uh, shielded, um, not through any motivation to shield it, but simply because, you know, if, if I you ran get it. in an organisation, you would speak to me, but no one else would know that I'd spoken to you. Um, and it was simply down to who you told or your note taking that we got anywhere. Now, what we're able to do now, of course, is to en masse uh, start tracking and recording every interaction and, of course, stripping out patterns and insights from those interactions. So I don't see us being very far away at all from a world where executives are educated to ask questions that technology can answer, um, which cannot be answered in a pre-technological world. And, and they already are educated to do that because I, I suspect that all of them are now uh, thinking that one one way to communicate to their um, audience, to their their um, their uh, people they serve. I'm not quite sure what the right term is. I'd say I'm yeah. searching for yeah. customers, but that's not quite yeah. right for a council. Clients, um, clients. They're 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 doing, their audience, uh, the people that yeah. they're serving. Mm, one yeah. way to reach out to them is with an email. And of course, that didn't exist before. You'd have to physically print a thing and put it in envelopes and send it to everyone and say, okay, your bin collection day is now Tuesday. But I get something every week that says, hey, it's Christmas, so we're not delivering, we're not taking your bins today, we're taking it tomorrow. Yeah. And th that yeah. saves them a huge amount of cost, but it's also much more reliable. Uh, yes. I might throw away the circular along with five other things from pizza places, but yeah. I'm, I'm more likely to read the email and pay attention and actually put my bins out on the right day and not complain to the council that they didn't pick them up. So that's something that I think has penetrated the boardroom. People think there's a way for me to communicate here that I didn't have before. Yeah. And, and, and there's this option to now ask better questions so you get better yeah. answers rather than outgoing. You're now going incoming. Correct. And that, that's, that's the point I wanted to jump in on to yeah. say, to say yes, that's, that's unidirectional. What we want to see is this bidirectional flow and then let's, let's raise the stakes even further and let's not broadcast that but let's personalise it so that Squirrel has the sensation that he is having a uniquely Squirrel-like conversation with the institution, be that the hospital or the council or the regulator um, or the airport or whoever it happens. They're writing to me about my roads. They're writing to me about the airplane, the plane flight I'm about to take or the, the events at the airport near me. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. And I think that's not penetrated at all. We've got tons of that in the um, for-profit world. The, the not-for-profit world, I think. At least I don't see it. No, no. Um, and, and I'd say the most uh, innovative of my clients are thinking in these ways. Mm -hmm. uh, 
starting to. Where the gap is for them, I don't think that the executives have an understanding of how they can convert that into reality via the design and application of a technology solution. So... Great. Well, and the reason I say great is because that's a problem that is, is relatively easy to help with. So it's not that, for example, that what they really need is a time machine from us, and they just need a time machine that will go back 37 years instead of 36, and they need us to make the time machine more, more accessible and easier to use. No, we don't have time machines. It's not possible. But what they do need is for us to take things that we're already using elsewhere and make them accessible for them and make sure that they're usable in those environments. Well, the good news is that's pretty easy to do. So yeah. um, that, that sounds very exciting. Tell me this, yeah. though. What would make them listen? So you and I, we, we worked together a bit on figuring out how, how to get people interested in this, and we, we got some hard no's. Um, and I'm curious, what, uh, what's motivating, what's interesting to the folks in the boardroom? Yeah. Um, you know, one was COVID. Uh, where they kind of got forced. Another was yeah. um, bring your yes. own device where people just started showing up with phones and they said, well, what do we do with these nurses who are suddenly taking pictures? Um, yeah. What what would get them excited? Is it another forcing function like that, an event in the world? Um, is there something else that would make them say, hey, wait a minute, there's an innovation here. I should look at this. I, I think that it's the pleasure pain principle at mm. work, which is address a known source of pain. Uh, so I'll, I'll give an example. One of my clients is the ambulance service. Uh, ambulance services everywhere struggle to meet the changing demands on ambulance services because it's not equal across the 24 hours of the day or the days of the week or the weeks of the year. And not uh, always predictable either. Not, not at all. Not mm -hmm. at all. And, of course, they're working in this multidimensional world where you've got needs out there, you've got ambulances which are staffed, and then you've got the destinations where the ambulances need to go, and they've got capacity constraints as well. So it's this, it's this you know, triangle of shifting dynamics that needs to be in real time uh, calculated. So, you know, Uber, by contrast, is dead simple compared to this um you know people say but well, how some of the same techniques can help so uber has things like surge pricing which exactly. occur because a computer yeah. somewhere not a human in some yeah. room with a, a whiteboard or something that a computer yes. goes hey there's extra demand here we have a, yeah. a spike that we didn't expect there's suddenly yeah. you know a bus strike or something has happened and mm -hmm. we need to get more to this location and so yeah. they raise prices um and they move yeah. um they motivate the drivers to go there that's right. I'm sure there's a different reaction. You wouldn't have surge pricing for ambulances, at least I hope not. But um, well, the same kind of tech could but, help but them. Effectively, but effectively, Squirrel, think about the equivalent. Um, it's not surge pricing, but it's response time dependent on urgency. And so, you know, if, if, if you've had a heart attack, um, you will get a quicker response than me who's uh, tripped in the backyard and appears to have broken my leg. Um, yes, and, you and, and I should. That should be different. But detecting right. that, I suspect, and, and adjusting to it in yeah. real time is a challenge that is very similar to Uber. Yeah, and the right. same that's kinds right. of technological yeah. innovations could help there. But, so um, to come back to your, your question, mm -hmm. what would get the attention of people, uh, you know, without speaking for my client, because I'm not, but my guess is think ambulance services. If anyone on this call had a way of saying to an ambulance service, using technology, we've got a way of determining the actual severity of need and even more importantly, whether an ambulance is in fact needed or Perfect. whether an alternative would occur, uh, yep. would, would, would be beneficial. Now, because, because what we have in that system built into it is waste. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, you've got ambulances through. cruising around and, and <laughs> sitting in the garage waiting and yeah. maybe you don't need them. That's it. That's it. So, uh, so and, uh, and you'd rather have them shifted to a time when you need them more. Well, this is a perfect application of something that I know all of us are, are getting a bit sick of hearing about, but artificial intelligence, um, the, the tools we have now for interpreting text, 
would be yeah. fantastic at this because mm -hmm. um, they could listen into the 999 call or um, even yeah. get um, some kind of communication from the person um, who's having the problem. And yes. um, th here's the crucial thing. What you wouldn't want is for it to, the computer to make the decision because the, the, you could have catastrophic responses, catastrophic results. I might yeah. be saying, um, yeah. my, my arm hurts. I'm, I'm really hurting in my arm. I, I'm really having a problem in my arm. Mm -hmm. And it says, oh, arm, you've probably broken your arm and doesn't send someone. I'm having a heart attack because one of the symptoms yeah. is you have a problem in exactly. your left arm. Yes. Uh, yes. But what's tremendously useful is, and, and I'll give an analogy actually from a completely different industry from, from construction, to have something that um, kicks out the anomalies to a human and does the basics. So yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, I, I had a uh, really fascinating company uh, that I looked at for my due diligence where I assess organizations. And this uh, company takes uh, sends um, low lower paid people, sort of ordinary people like you and me who aren't super experts in, in architecture, sends them into skyscrapers that are being built. And they'll go to the 35th floor and they just take random pictures. They're just going around picture, picture, picture. They don't know what they're taking a picture of. So they, but their goal is volume, just produce a whole lot of pictures of this partially built 35th floor. And then that's handed to an artificial intelligence system, which is smart enough to say, well, these 17 pictures all look normal. The 18th, there's something anomalous here. I'm not sure what it is, but I'm expecting to see a sprinkler. I don't see one. I see a bump in the wall. There's something funny. Send it to a human. Mm -hmm. And then they ship those pictures to expert architects and they yeah. don't have to look through the thousands of pictures. They have to look through a tiny number and they mm -hmm. go, okay, that one, uh, that bump there is where someone has put the drywall up over the sprinkler. Well, that's not going to work very well. We need to send yeah. somebody to room 37 on the 35th floor to go and fix that problem. And what they didn't have to do was have an expert architect where they used to do is get send an architect on site who would go around and check everything and look at all in, in detail. But they can be far away in a far away country, actually, yeah. uh, and go and check the small number of anomalies. Mm -hmm. We could do exactly the same thing. Something is obvious. I phone up and I say, you know, um, I, I fell off of a three story building and I'm, uh, my uh, you know, I, this person fell off a three story building. They're not breathing. That's obvious. We don't need a computer to tell us to send an ambulance. But if I phone up and say my, my arm is hurting, uh, it really is hurting, it's been hurting for hours, mm -hmm. um, the computer can say, well, that's anomalous because it is the left arm. Mm -hmm. It's the right arm, we're not so worried, but the left arm, we are worried. Um, yeah. This is one that a human should listen to. And then that person phones me back and say, any other symptoms? You know, what's your weight? What's your breathing? And so on. And then they send an ambulance. This is the sort of thing that everybody should know about, that these things are possible now. They weren't possible just three or four years ago, but there, there's a revolution happening, just like bring your own device. Yeah. 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 And I think really these folks haven't heard about, and I want to talk more about their motivations and, and how to yeah. uh, think about motivating folks to um, think about it. But, but what, what's your thought about um, oh. using these tools? Oh, absolutely. I'm, I'm, I've got hairs on the back of my neck standing up as you're talking, school mm. because... I look at the strategic view for my clients and I'm not thinking purely about, oh, efficiencies and better customer service and these sorts of things. They are vital, but I'm asking bigger questions, which is what is it that makes an ambulance service truly valuable to its community? Well, the true value is when you actually get someone to hospital so they don't die uh, when there is a, a truly life-threatening situation. Um, uh, and uh, if you've got zero exceptions, you've got something quite remarkable. Now, there is mm -hmm. no system in the world that can deliver that, but we could get closer and closer to it. And what you said a moment ago is that technology vigilance um, has the ability to do a couple of things. It can track and monitor more instances of something and it can look more um, effectively at detecting anomalies or anomalous behaviour. And so exactly. what it feels to me is um, uh, I was in an Uber recently and I always talk to the Uber drivers and ask them, what do you do when you're not an Uber driver? And uh, one of them said, well, I'm uh, a PhD student, actually, and I asked, well, what are you, what's your dissertation on? And he uh, is uh, doing research towards the creation of a medical device that is worn by elderly people and it detects GAIT, G-A-I-T. Um, yes. Because what it's it... It's an early do, warning sign for a bunch of different illnesses, some of which have nothing to do with walking. And, and falls largely. Yes. So, so oh, right, yeah. 
can do is if, if it detects an anomalous gait, it can predict that I am more likely to fall in the next seven to 10 days. Um, and it means I can then go and see someone or uh, stop the physical activity before. And I may not even have noticed. You know, I remember when my parents were getting older, they changed yeah. how they walked. But I would yeah. point it out to them and say, oh, yeah, you're right. I didn't realize, you know, I am walking more on my right. But they didn't pick it up. So they wouldn't have gone, oh, let's go to the doctor. I might fall down. Yeah. Yeah. That'd be very and, important. And, you know, I've got another one. Can I just try one more before on you before I forget? Because yeah. um, it just struck me. When you talked about volume, it, this mm. would be harder to do in the ambulance case, but think of the road case. You've got road crews already driving all over the, the vicinity, right? They're driving all over the, the city yeah. to, to fix other potholes. But while they're doing that, they could have a dash cam. Yeah. And the dash cam is busy filming the road. You could even just point it down. You wouldn't care about the other traffic. You'd care about pointing yeah. it down at the road. Yeah. And yeah. Um, that you could do exactly what the architects did, uh, mm -hmm. where you're checking and you're saying, well, this is a place that's about to buckle, right? This is a part of the road yeah. that looks like it's um, having a problem. It's starting to get an indentation. It'll be a big pothole soon. Mm -hmm. And you send a road crew early. And you don't have any significant additional cost to do that. You have the cost of the dash cams and things. But the computer does all the anomaly detection. I call this, by the way, a centaur. This is a human computer hybrid. And this is the most important, one of the most important things to recognize about this AI stuff. People keep saying, oh, yes, it's going to write all our emails for us. It's going to take over the world. We, you know, humans will be all out of jobs. That's not what I predict. What I expect is we'll have these situations like the architects, like the road example I was just making up, where uh, you've got a, a smaller number of expert humans and a large quantity of data being churned through by a computer to just kick out the anomalies. And, and you can set the computer to say, look, show me anything that looks weird. And if you look at it and say, oh, this one's fine, throw it away. This one's fine. Throw, oh, my God, this is going to be a crater. You know, we're not going to be able to drive on this road soon. Send somebody right now. That's got a really high value, I should think. Yeah. And, and, I, and I think in society, if you recollect how I introduced myself, I, I said I work with the organisations that run the systems that run society. Now, the reality is that a huge number of those systems are, in fact, deeply repetitive um, and uh, they're not of high value per se. So uh, an example being, well, you know, you have a, a driver's licence, presumably, um, do. as do I, and as do most of the people who would be watching this live stream. Now, what value is there in actually processing applications for a driver's licence? There's actually not a huge amount of value in this, yet it chews up countless human hours um, it, I can see a world where those sorts of processes are almost entirely uh, immediate and automated, except for what we're talking about, the anomalous situation. So Exactly. Uh, and you know a yeah, place where yeah. that's in use today, where that's mm -hmm. actually operating, where someone has been innovative, someone has picked it up, and that's in airports. When, if you've been right. through an airport recently and you've, you've um, uh, uh, maybe yeah. handed over your boarding pass, but you previously would have handed it to a human who might have stamped it and checked it and done other things. Now you put it on a little computer and you, you get your face um, uh, uh, picture taken yeah. and yeah. it lets you through or it doesn't. It's going to kick mm -hmm. out an anomaly if, if my skin is dark and the, my picture in my passport is of a white person. It's yeah. going to say, wait a minute, some, maybe I just got a suntan. We don't know, but we'll send it to a human. Yeah. Um, but if I look just like my picture and um, I'm, I'm not on any databases of dangerous people, off I go. And, mm -hmm. and that's just hugely more efficient and better for the, um, the customer. So it's, it's not mm -hmm. just that it saves cost, but yeah. there's this further motivation of, man, I don't have to stand in a long queue. I can just go beep and on mm -hmm. I go in most cases, except where there's an anomaly. Yeah. So yeah. Yeah. There, there's huge motivation here. There's huge, huge value. Um, but uh, um, uh, let, let me just uh, tell you one other story, and I want I want to hear what what's the thinking because I want to come to this um, motivation question which Roland was yeah. asking us, sure. um, uh, which is where I started. But we got we got on all these great technological solutions. I used to play a game with the uh, people in my staff, people in my technology team, and the game was called the Why Game. And I would explain to them that uh, look, you you can't lose the Why Game. Only I can lose the Why Game. But what I was looking for was to understand the motivation and the understanding of my staff. Mm. And what I would say is, what are you working on now? And they'd say, oh, well, I'm fixing this bug in the software. or I'm adding this new button or something. Mm. And I'd say, why are you doing that? 
and, and I sort of turned on my inner five-year-old and I would just keep asking why. So I'm adding a button. Why? Well, it's in the, the ticket that tells me to add the button. Well, why is the ticket there? Well, because the customer asked for it. Why did the customer ask for it? Well, because they can't uh, run this report without a button. And why do they need the report? And I'd keep going. Sometimes it would take quite a while. And sometimes I'd get to a point where the person said, look, I just have no clue. <laughs> it's just, uh, they're, they're running reports. I don't know why they run reports. Um, uh, there, there's some motivation for it. I don't understand. I said, great. I lost. Because I haven't helped you to understand yeah, why this report yeah, is useful. Yeah. So I need to go do something about that. But then they could win. We could both win. And that mm -hmm. would be if they said, well, the report is given to the board. And the board then makes budget decisions. And that helps them to decide how to invest further in their business. And I would say, well, why does the uh, board care about that? And if I could get them to say profit or money or revenue or cost or something like that, we had both won. Because we had gotten to the fundamental motivation which yeah. was why are we building the button which runs the report, which gives people information to change their investment? Mm -hmm. Well, it's because we can make more money by doing that ultimately. But that's not the motivation here. So I'm curious, what's the equivalent of the why game? If I were to go and play the why game with sure. uh, some of these organizations, what, what yeah. would I hear back? How would I know if I'd won? The end of the why game, the holy grail, is impact. And it's impact on whoever your constituents or clients or uh, stakeholders are uh, in accordance with whatever the mission of the organisation is. So let me give you an example, a really practical Please. one. Yeah. It's, directly, it's, it's, it's out of COVID. So mm -hmm. uh, one of my clients was uh, one of the government entities that is responsible for titles, as in land titles. So if you buy or sell property, you're all working presumably in environments or countries where there is a central repository of land titles mm -hmm. and there is, in, in Australia, we call it settlement. So, you know, I buy a property from, from you, Squirrel, uh, and the property settles. What does that actually mean? Well, it means that the title transfers from you to me um, after monies have been paid and there's then, you know, a, a, a tracking mechanism for this. Now, this is all very straightforward in the vast majority of cases and my client, who runs millions of these things in a year um, with a few hundred staff, uh, is increasingly automating this so that now over 95% of these cases are automated. There's no human touch at all. Mm -hmm. But... Uh, there are those cases where human touch is needed. So in the days before COVID, guess what used to happen? Surveyor went out. When, Sorry? Does, did they send a surveyor to go and look at the land? Well, no. What would happen is that people would sit in a, a, a large office building in the centre of the city uh, where 200 of them are working away at these uh, uh, transactions and a difficult one would arrive and it would come to me as the human because I'm smarter than the machine and I can deal with all of the variables that the machine can't deal with. So I try to solve it. But guess what? Even I can't solve all of them. So I would stand up. And I would walk over to my more experienced colleague and I would say, Terry, have a look at this. What do you think we need to do here? And mm -hmm. we'd discuss it and Terry would advise and then I'd come back and I'd take care of it all and uh, that'd be great. The problem is, of course, is that occasionally Terry's busy or Terry's gone out for lunch or Terry's sick um, or Terry says he'll do it, but he forgets. And so what ends up happening at the end of the day is that there are a large-ish number of unclosed files or cases at the end of each day. Mm -hmm. Now, is that good for the customer who actually is waiting, sometimes with some really strong reasons for this, to yeah. be able to achieve settlement on a property? This is terrible. And so this organisation wants to have 99.99999% fulfilment of these transactions, and it can't. It's only got 98 point something. Um, and you might argue, well, that's close enough. No, it's not. Um, it needs to be a universal, utterly reliable service. So let me, this is turning into a longer story than I'd, I'd expect. That's okay. But, Keep going. We love your stories. Go ahead. But, but guess what happened in COVID? COVID comes along. Couldn't walk Every, over to Terry. Correct. Everybody is sent home. 
Now, what they're given to work with is a team collaboration platform, virtual, that enables me to sit at home and look at that file and say, you know, I don't know the answer to this. I then put it up in the collaboration platform and said, hey, can someone take a look at this? <laughs> so we're not dependent on Terry anymore. We're dependent on anyone within the group. So you get all of the collaboration. Um, yep. People are saying, give that one to me. I've done 10 of those. I can do it in two minutes. Uh, someone else says, oh, Terry's the guy to speak to. Uh, he's not here, but Deborah, she's pretty good at it. Go to her. Um, and uh, ping, ping, ping. Um, within the first month, they had an unprecedented level, performance level, of closed out cases or rather a very, very, very low number of unclosed out cases on a daily basis. Now, did this make their CEO utterly delighted? You bet. Did it make the staff feel as though they are doing a brilliant job? Absolutely. And yeah, did it, the customers were really excited. The number of complaints yeah, from yeah. aggrieved customers? You bet. And then the time needed to transact those complaints. Um, so it was a win-win-win on every front. Um, and again, you know, what's the motivation or, or where's the why? The why in this is fundamentally meet every client's needs, no matter how complex or how unique. And so I would say that applies whether you're a, a regulator, a healthcare provider, a cemetery, um, a, an airport. You know, that, and every that one of those could use yeah. technological solutions that they probably aren't. And yeah. their boards of directors and their leaders, for the reasons we talked about, are not as aware of that as they could yeah. be. That's so that's really helpful to understand the motivation. And the why game you might play there is to go to um, the, the people, say, who are working around that table, who are working on the settlements, and to ask them, well, why are you working on these settlements? Well, so that we can service people and they can get in their houses better and they can uh, get to our, our mission. Yeah. And if you then talk to some engineers, those engineers might say, well, wait a minute, I see there's a backlog happening here. I'm trained in how to look for um, bottlenecks and problems in systems. Yeah. And I can see the bottleneck is Terry. We, mm -hmm. And actually, uh, I'm, I'm referring now, come back in two weeks and, and I'm going to do the event on this. There's all kinds of technological things that you can mm. do to mm. relieve those back those bottlenecks and those backlogs. We we do it in technology all the time, and there are loads of uh, methods for that. Mm. But you need somebody with that um, kind of creative thinking yeah. to to say, wait a minute, there's a way I can apply this thing over here to this mm. problem over there. Once mm. you've identified it, wow, that seems really powerful, and um, it's risky for the organizations to rely on their in-house folks who may not be terribly technological to do this. And there's lots of opportunities to go outside, get advice, and then find ways to, to really make huge strides forward if they want to do that. And, and, and this is, this is the, the interesting question. This is a question back at you now from me, Squirrel, mm -hmm. because people, I think, believe that their organisation has borders and boundaries and they don't look outside they don't ask well who else has solved this problem elsewhere in a different way in a different context and it might well be that you know the zoo has solved a problem that is relevant to the land titles office uh, or but as we were thinking it. uber has solved a problem that's relevant to ambulances correct correct um, so, so I suppose my question is, what is it that technologically adept and literate folks can do to enable clients like mine to lift their gaze and look out and be curious enough to well, get inspiration from elsewhere? Absolutely. Well, sharing examples like this, one reason we wanted to do this live stream was so that we could share it with people like that and they could watch yeah. it and get, get ideas. So I hope that some of them are watching and getting ideas and others will watch the recording in the future. Uh, yes. And um, if you are in the habit of looking for those ideas, and, and uh, my friend Marcus, the guy on the train in the um, uh, network rail, is a perfect example of this because he's just always very curious about random things. And it, it, he, 
uh, worked with me on in a in a client doing um, uh, anti money laundering. And he went from network rail to money laundering. What you know? Uh -huh. How could he possibly sure. know anything about money laundering? He didn't, but he was very curious. He learned about it, and he brought ideas all the time from other you know, environments that were mm -hmm. very creative for helping people with this important financial problem that he didn't know anything about. So yeah. Yeah. Um, creating that intellectual curiosity is very important and bringing in examples which inspire people. So, um, you know, I had that example of the architect um, uh, looking at the uh, anomalous bits of the uh, skyscraper, the, the pictures uh, and, and looking at the anomalies. And then I thought immediately, wait a minute, uh, potholes are an example of an anomaly. It just happens to be two-dimensional. happens to be on a road instead of um, inside a building. And surely the same kinds of things would apply. So yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, I think the, the main thing is to have a rich library of examples. And yeah. uh, they're out there, yeah. but you do have to yeah. look for them. And you have to have a kind of technological mindset. And of course, having outside help can be helpful in that. But you know, if you're uh, if you're reading, I, I don't know what the Australian equivalent of the Wall Street Journal is, but if you're reading something sure. like that, you will see yeah. those stories about how someone Indeed. is using technology. And then you think to yourself, how can I use that here at my cemetery or my zoo or uh, whatever my or uh, my uh, aid organization? Yeah, yeah. It, it's there's a there's a terrific story uh, that comes to my mind uh, mm -hmm. concerning one of my clients where uh, the, it, it's an organisation that e it exists for the purpose of representing the interests of health consumers so that they get good treatment and uh, fair treatment by healthcare providers. And so they're a kind of advocacy and mobilisation uh, group. And, mm -hmm. you know, their job is to go and rattle cages and shine spotlights into dark corners and, and this sort of thing. And it um, came to their notice that there were some women out there who were experiencing um, life-altering and crippling pain following the insertion of a particular uh, medical device. Um, it's a type of vaginal mesh that, that, that women, uh, uh, some women need after childbirth, um, in midlife, et cetera, et cetera. And um, what uh, they, their initial response was, we need to do a research project in order to determine what numbers of women are out there with this concern. And their CEO, to his credit, said, well, we could do that, but that would take us years. Um, it would cost a lot of money. Uh, we don't know exactly which university would undertake this for us and even how valid the findings would be. Uh, what if we simply used social media to put the word out and see how many people we could identify who put their hands up to say, yes, I've had one of these implants. It hasn't gone as well as I'd hoped. My life has actually turned into a bit of a disaster zone as a result. And in Australia alone, that process, which cost them almost nothing, within weeks had identified 10,000 women. Um, now, this in turn led to their participation in one of the largest class action cases <laughs> against a medical device manufacturer, um, and it was international in the end. So it didn't emanate from Australia, but it was the use of technology that uh, uh, was an alternative way of revealing a widespread phenomenon that was otherwise invisible. Wonderful. And again, it's fulfilling their mission. So rather right. than being motivated by making a bunch of money or, or winning money in the lawsuit or something, like that, that's not no. their thinking. No. But no. if I were to play my why game with anybody yeah. at that organization, they'd be thinking, how do we help more women to be in less pain? Wouldn't that be great right. if we reduce pain, yeah. held people to account, they improved the healthcare um, tools, that they, they caught these things more early and, and they, they uh, addressed these problems. That, yes. that's, that's their motivation. So. And, and, and interestingly, this organisation wants to understand what are the biggest issues facing people in society today from a health perspective, where the biggest gaps exist between what's promised and what's actually delivered. 
So if, if you think about did that help them achieve their mission, oh, you bet. Um, yes, there's a huge uh, gap there, and they're going to close it and, and and by quite a lot. Part. Absolutely, yeah. Fantastic. Well, it strikes me, you know, you were talking earlier about how technology appears in your art gallery example, and I'm sure in all these other organizations too, it kind of gets spread out. It's kind of mushed out across yeah. the organization. And you've got the curator doing the exhibition, but then you've also got people in the gift shop looking at the data of who's buying. And then you've got somebody else who's looking out for membership and donations and so on. Yeah. So it gets mushed out. One thing I was thinking when I first heard that was, oh, what they need is a CTO. What they need is somebody to bring it all together and drive it. Mm -hmm. Now that I've heard your description, I'm thinking what they need is not a, a single leader, but they need a mechanism for all those folks to talk to each other, because it may turn out that the information that the gift shop needs to um, sell better also influences what the curator can bring in, what should the next exhibition be, and that influences who the uh, what donations they should seek. And all of that, if that were together in some data warehouse or something of that kind, if that were technologically used in a clever way, would help all of them. Mm -hmm. And they may need some outside influence to bring that together, to get those ideas in, to get the juices flowing, look at the examples of Uber or, or someone else with uh, ideas that are helpful. But it feels like to me, you need the line management thinking about technology, and that would yeah. naturally be part of your strategy. So <laughs> when they're saying, look, we have these seven problems, we need to do these to achieve our mission. Yes. Thinking about how each of those could be influenced by technology and how you can get the line management thinking that way to bring the ideas from the grassroots. That sounds like a really interesting strategy. What do you think? I, I, I would agree. And uh, my sense is that there are a number of fundamental enabling factors, technology being one. Uh, another would be, well, the, the talent pool and the culture within the organisation. A third would be the ability to bring in financial resources so you can actually fund things that matter because you can have all the good ideas in the world uh, <laughs> without the money to pay for them and uh, you're stuck. Uh, so uh, I, I, in my in my sense, I am a believer in understanding strategically, okay, why do we exist fundamentally? Uh, where are we going and what does the future look like and how is it different to today? How then do we work backwards on the things we need to work on? And then what are the enabling factors? And they are in, invariably going to be around these factors, like technology being one of them. Um, but it's going uh, to apply across your organisation. It's going to apply in the gift shop and in the um, correct. Uh, curation and so on. And it so, is. therefore, you need to look at it for each of the factors, each of the goals you're trying to achieve, what might come out of your strategy session, and then work out how can the people who are executing this use a number of enabling factors. We can get them better funding. Excellent. But they can spend that money on some technology that will really help them achieve our mission. Exactly. Because the enabling factors are not unitary themselves because they hang together uh, equally in a bit of a matrix. So, uh, yeah, this is absolutely right. Um, and that's right. But but it, it, it is a challenge, and I know there are organisations I work with uh, where, yes, they have a... Uh, often they don't have a CTO, but they will have a senior person uh, at executive level who is responsible for... And, and often it's bundled into corporate services. So it's the same person who runs finance and human resources, uh, and then they'll run, uh, you know, information systems um, uh, as well. Now, that is not an ideal circumstance for giving technology the attention it deserves and elevating it uh, to a very powerful enabler. But what it doesn't strike me, and, and this is what I've really changed my mind about as a result of talking to you, it always happens when I get to talk to you, Andrew, I've changed my mind into thinking you don't necessarily need then to appoint a person who's just in charge of technology. No, no. What you might need is for that person who's already running it to then get some help or to find a way to get those individual line managers to be thinking, well, part of my enabling factor, part of where I can spend some money yeah. is on a technological solution. Here's some, a library of examples that I can draw from. And yeah. the folks on the, on the ground are likely to be the ones who understand it. That's what I see over and over again in for-profit organizations. Sounds like it's um, similar in, in not-for-profit. 
Yeah, look, I, I think that's right. Um, and, I mean, I would love to see a world, quite frankly, where, uh, yeah, organisations were enabled to have these conversations at all different levels, asking fundamental questions. So, you know, one of my clients is a large aged care provider. That means they are delivering um, ageing services to people in uh, retirement villages and then when the needs get greater in uh, residential aged care the nursing home type model, um, and even beyond that into hospices and palliative care. But even before any of that, they provide in-home uh, services uh, to people who have um, not necessarily even ageing-related uh, limitations. Uh, there could be some form of disability. Now, uh, the question one can ask there is, well, how could we use technology to interact better with our clients, to deliver more services to our clients, um, to understand when clients' needs change uh, far more accurately, um, and to resolve issues or complaints uh, more readily. Now, there are four that just spring to mind immediately. And uh, I think what we have is something that says, you know, we will behave reactively, so we will address things as they arise, but it's not a proactive uh, way of thinking about this that says, let's, over the next 12 months, set up a series of dialogues that is designed to give us some insights into two or three investments we could make that are going to have the greatest bang for the buck, so to speak, or the greatest impact dividend, let's call it that, uh, and uh, I would I would love to talk with my clients about how they could do that. Fantastic. Okay. Well, we're at the time we said we'd have, and we've answered a few questions and and got real good ideas from from uh, from Andrew, which I really appreciate. Um, and uh, folks who've been uh, watching, I hope that this has been helpful to you. Uh, you know where to find uh, us for for more questions. Let's see. The first thing to say is uh, if you want to find Andrew, I'll put his contact uh, up here on the screen. Andrew, you tell me if I've got the right one. But uh, this is this is how you find Andrew if you're interested yep. in talking to him about nonprofits yep. around the globe. He's in Australia, but he works with people yep. everywhere. I can never work out where he is. Um, <laughs> but I think I think you're and, at home in Australia now, given the and, time. And if, and if anyone if anyone uh, is is interested and you read books digitally or otherwise, uh, go to the website. You can have a copy of this uh, with my compliments. Uh, it's called From Impossible to Possible, and it's it's essentially uh, around the things we're talking about here today. How do you Fantastic. get strategic alignment on the things that really matter to organisations that are delivering some societal purpose? as opposed to a financial profit. Well, fantastic. That's been such an interesting topic to look at today. And um, of course, if you're interested in hearing more from me, if you want to um, get involved in the Squirrel Squadron Forum, for example, uh, where we're going to be discussing this and, and some other ideas related to it, we're always bringing up those kinds of topics with the thousands of people on the forum. So uh, head over to squirrelsquadron.com, easy to join up and come to more events uh, that I'll be leading as well. Um, Andrew, thank you so much for being with us. Really appreciate it. And uh, hope we'll uh, have you on here again soon and, and people right. will come back with lots more questions. Fantastic. It's been a pleasure. Thanks Likewise. so much. Fantastic. Thanks so much. And Andrew, stay there. I'll keep chatting to you, but I'll say goodbye to all our, our listeners and viewers here. Thank you.